anecdotes from a rogue engineer. Um, I'm going to try not to offend anybody. However, this is a talk from a production aspect. Uh, it's not a conservation drainage talk. It's not an environmental talk. It's a production talk as to how to maximize our opportunities to get the most yields out of our fields. So take it with a grain of salt. I'm going to address the con conservation issues where I can, but that's not the, this is more farmer driven than, than the other way around. So I uh, always have to show that slide because we're going to talk a lot about the installation side of things and call that number to cover your butt because I have hung into wires that were my own that I didn't know they were there. Uh, it's very easy to hang into a telephone wire or more importantly a fiber if you're like the county, Wicomico County Roads. They decided they didn't want to pick up dead deer. They did it with a great all and they cut a fiber line that cost them $270,000 to fix just for a dead deer. So call that number. So. Um, Jamie, you're going to recognize this. This comes from you. We've got to go ahead and mention all the federal stuff to make sure I've got my butt covered. Uh, before you go draining things, talk to NRCS and FSA. Ask them if it's okay. Can we get away with this? Um, you don't want to get yourself jammed up on federal programs. There's a whole bunch of laws here. I'm not going to get into detail, but the Swamp Buster Act is the one you really got to be worried about. So. Talk to Jamie, talk to your NRCS folks before you get started doing any drainage. Uh, I know plenty of people that do it and ask for forgiveness afterwards, but that can be a big, big problem. All right, so we've got two concerns. This slide is from Rich Gorlick from a tile drainage session we did about a year ago, um, looking at whether we want to look at a surface water concern, that's what this picture would be, or a groundwater driven concern. Just a matter of what the source of the water is. Is the water running across the surface and just ponding there, or is it something where you've got elevation on the sides and it's supplying it from under the subsurface of the soil or the field? So before we get started, we've got to determine the feasibility. And this has changed immensely in the past 10 years with the gross ad adaptation, or adoption rather, of auto steer systems, because we've got some really good elevation data that was used to be very hard to generate. Because before, we were either out there with a laser or a transit sometimes a GPS trying to do a survey, but think about a tractor going across the field, it's dropping a dot recording what it's doing every foot, foot and a half, something like that, and giving me a precision RTK grade, especially when you're making multiple passes across the field over a year. You get a real good elevation model coming out of auto steer systems only when you're using RTK. And one of the things I want to caution everybody on with the precision ag maps coming out your vertical accuracy out of RTK system has four times the error of your X and Y. So if your auto steer is good for plus or minus an inch, your vertical accuracy is plus or minus four inches. Sometimes that's good enough, sometimes it's not. You can make it a little better by using base stations and other things like that, but don't go heavily relying on data when somebody says they're just using Terrastar or SPS2 or something like that where it's not a RTK correction, it may not be the accuracy level you need to really do a design. Uh, when we started talking about elevation and potential outlets, that gets a little trickier. We got to do more data than what an auto steer system is going to put out. But ideally, we like to have 0.3% of fall, four inches per hundred foot or so. Uh, we can get away at 0.1, we do a lot of installations at 0.1%. And I've done installations at 0 0.02, but that gets really tricky on the installation part, especially with small diameter tile, keeping that grade steady. Uh, it can be done uh, with an excavator. It's really tricky. With some of the automated equipment, it can be a little bit easier. All right. So there's a couple of ways we can determine our grade, whether we can actually make this thing work. Start out with a line level. That's going to be your most basic a little hook on a string, uh, using in construction quite regularly. Water levels, basic, same basic principle, but piece of tube. It gets to be unwieldy when you're talking field scale stuff because I want to know whether I've got grade over a 700 to 1500 foot span. We start getting to builders levels and transits. Uh, you're going to have to have a little bit of experience and a little bit of knowledge to be able to use those tools. It's not something you just take off the shelf and an amateur can go with without understanding some surveying skills. Laser levels have made life easy. They're cheap, they're easy, you can get dual sloping, single sloping, or just regular 
uh, lasers that are going to give you an output. Let's say I want to hit that 0.1% grade. Our laser, I can dial it to 0.1, it sets it on an angle, and my guy in the trench, all he's got to do is make sure that that survey rod stays at six feet all the time. And if it's beeping at six feet, we're right because the slope is already taken care of with the laser rather than having to do our distance calculations and figure out a fall that way. So life has gotten a lot easier. You can buy these things for under a thousand dollars now. You get looking on eBay, I think you can find them for like 200. I don't know whether to trust them or not. But there's all kinds of different grades. Keep in mind that some lasers, because of that accuracy, have a little bit of wobble in them. They're all going to have a little bit of wobble in them. It's not a big deal if you're looking at just using that over a 300 foot span. And that's where a lot of builders levels come into play. They're doing a construction site. Everything's tight. You're not looking at things going out past two, three hundred feet. You start doing a farm scale, you need something that's going to hold that accuracy out there 800 feet, 1,000 feet or farther. And so when the cheap ones, I start getting nervous if you're doing a long run. So there's your transit. There's your laser. This little readout is going to pick up this laser signal, whether it's sloped or not. Uh, you can set it for tight tolerance or wide tolerance. It usually has a beeper that goes with it. And it, it, as a general rule, that beeper is loud enough that I can be sitting in an excavator and I can hear a man in the trench hold that thing up. And when I hear a steady beep, I know I hit the level right. I don't have to do anything. Uh, when I see him wiggling one way or the other, he's trying to find that grade. So that beep feature is nice from an operator standpoint because you can almost, you, he doesn't have to tell you what's going on. You can hear it already. When we start looking at the RTK grade stuff, uh, you can use a number of different softwares to try and determine this elevation. This is coming out of WM Drain, which is a Trimble product. Uh, it'll give you that topography. This came straight out of a planner. Uh, the planning tractor was mapping the RTK. And when you do the analysis on this, it tells you the flow paths for surface drainage, which way that water is naturally trying to go based on the grade that's in the field. So this is helpful for you trying to do a design to figure out here's where we want the water to go, here's the natural flow path, because we really kind of hard to fight nature. We don't, if you look at these arrows, if I was trying to drain this, it's going to be hard for me to drain it this way. That flow path is going to be extremely beneficial when you're trying to do a design. Now, try to see if Rich, yeah, Rich is in the back. How long would it take you traditionally to generate something like this using a survey pole and, and, and data points and then mapping it by hand? A day. And this is coming out after you hit the button that said generate 3D topography. It takes it 10 to 15 seconds to do the process and it gives us the answer. It's, it's immensely easier now than, than the labor that would have to be done by the engineers and surveyors going prop forward. Okay, so here's one of the data points coming out of one of the research farm at Georgetown. We've got a ditch here. We've got a water hole in here that goes all the way across this field. And our natural thought was, well, we, want to, we actually wanted to go this way with it. Um, that doesn't really work too well after we start looking at the RTK data coming out of the plant and tractor. In this case, actually, it was a sprayer. So it's really beneficial from that perspective. All right, so we go back to the surface water driven concern that Rich was talking about and what solutions we've got to do that from a farmer level that I can handle without having to call a contractor. And we've got a number of tools. The one in the upper left hand corner I'm sure you've seen on most farms are around. Uh, one little side note for the farmers in the room, they have got these things now where they've got a very small wheel on them, like a nine inch wheel on them. So you don't break your neck when you hit them in the sprayer. Uh, sometimes that may be of a benefit because 12 inch wheel can really rock you going across with, with, in the tractor and tear equipment up. Some of the big ones, and I'd, I'd really love to see the one in the uh, lower left-hand corner run, uh, they're more for for forming permanent swales, deeper uh, channels, not something that you're going to be as a temporary. It's more of a permanent moving. And if you can see in the right-hand corner, they're working that piece of ground, uh, multiple passes trying to establish that grade with that whirlwind. I think that's called a, either a tornado or a hurricane uh, ditcher. Other options uh, that don't involve rotary are your number of greater blades and V-plows, that type of stuff. This stuff can be equipped with laser readouts. So we would mount on the tip a external laser receiver that will tell me in the cab that I'm high, low, 
or right on target. Well, I use this for grading roads quite regularly because I've got a slope on the road and I want it, the water to run down the edge of the roads in one direction. We use that laser readout to tell us what, what's going on. Some of them are mounted external from the cab. Some of them have a little readout inside the cab. If you want to go full whole hog with it, uh, there are manufacturers in Europe that make add-ons to go on ag leader equipment and trimble equipment that will do this with GPS fairly inexpensively. Otherwise, you're getting into the top con stuff, the construction grade stuff, where you're looking at $15,000 and you can do a GPS grade. I tend to stay away from that because it's not affordable. But there is machine control. You can machine control it with laser too to make it fully automated. Leave the hydraulics on and the, the laser is going to say, hey, we're going to move it up or down. Yes, Will? Do, do you have, like, if you're doing this in the field, do you have to have uh, like full till produce blades? And so his question was, do we need to have full tillage in order for these blades to work? And I'm going to say most of the time. Uh, depending on the crop. Uh, you can go in behind soybeans if it's been hit with a turbo till and usually that's fine enough chop that it'll roll but corn stalks you're just going to make a big old ball. Uh, if you've got sod in there, if anybody tried to ever grade a lane or grade a driveway that's got grass in it, it doesn't work. You're going to have to kill that grass in order for it to be able to roll and sometimes you're going to have to till it in order for it to be able to chop up enough to roll off the end. But full tillage is going to work better for any kind of grading work with a blade uh, versus trying to go in there just no-till. And then you can go to the super duper stuff. I have to include these pictures because the ag engineer, this kind of power makes me excited. Um, you know, this, is, this is some serious deal and that's something for a contractor to have. Um, and you can see on the front of the top picture, he's got a laser pole up there where he's trying to get some signal and he's probably got a GPS receiver up in here somewhere. Most of the time that's going to run in a similar fashion to like a pan uh, that they're doing pads with for chicken houses or anything else where they've got that feedback loop coming back in. Most of the time that's going to be automatic. There's some other options for maintaining ditches that are already there. Uh, you know, you see some well-established ditching, especially in southern Delaware, uh, eastern shore of Maryland, uh, where it was pattern ditched back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And one of the things that we often forget is these were set on grade, and we need to keep that grade. And sometimes it's going to involve getting back in there with a laser. I, I cannot count the number of times where I've seen somebody put in an irrigation system, put in their crossings for the pivot, but they didn't clean the ditch out before they put the crossings in. You come back to clean the ditch back out and you find out your crossing pipes are 12 inches above the true grade of the ditch, which means you're digging that crossing back up. And that's, that's something that everybody needs to be thinking about. You're going to put a crossing in, you've got to get that whole ditch set back on grade. You need to have a laser in the field to make sure you set them right because a tile, hopefully, is a one time every 30 year installation or more. We don't want to be coming back and fixing it. <coughs> then we get into Tile wells, these are straight from uh, Rich Gorlick. Here's one of the installations that he designed. And then we got a blind inlet on the other side. And that's, we'll, we'll briefly get into those types of scenarios as far as whether they're an option for some fields. He does a, a great job of cranking out some designs and, uh, and explaining why we should site them where we should with some nice drainage and some pictures to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be taking this water straight to the ditch. We should be doing something else with it. So when we get into groundwater versus surface water, our tools and our options become a little more limited and a little more expensive. So if we've got a hillside seep, let's say we've got a hill that's got significant grade above us, we need to intercept that water before it gets to the low spot. That's usually going to mean some sort of tile going parallel to the grade of a hill to intercept what's coming down out of it. Uh, you can try and intercept the spring or, or the spot that is coming out, but it gets really tricky. Uh, a tile line up and down the hill tends to work, or with the hill, not up and down the hill, tends to work better. Trying to put a tile well in the bottom of the hole does fix the problem. However, you're not getting it at the source. You've already got a mud hole before you get it gone. Pattern tiling has its applications. We're going to get into detail as where pattern tiling tends to work and where it doesn't. It's very dependent on your soil type. And we're finding that it does work in clay, even though most, in theory, it shouldn't. Uh, it does provide some benefit. You may or may not need a sock around that tile, depending on what kind of soil you've got. All right, so here's a, uh, 
tile plan, herringbone type plan. This is out of Ohio, uh, drawn on paper. And you can see they've de delineated where their wet spots are and started to pull that herringbone in there to try and intercept that water before it gets in. Uh, that was an installation that was done probably 40 years ago on a, a collaborator's farm. And he pulled these out of the, out of the archives. This is a fairly new installation after it was done, drone imagery of it. Uh, it can get pretty complicated if you've got slope. I'm very fortunate uh, in that most of the fields I deal with don't have a lot of elevation change. Uh, so my experience is limited on that. You get some folks that are in Ohio, Pennsylvania and whatnot, they've got a lot more knowledge on how to do some creative designs that look like this. So I'll we'll give you a little quiz. We've got a field that looks like this. Now your red areas are your low areas, your high areas are your green. You've got a ditch across this side, right beside the road. And it's a deep ditch. It's deeper than I am tall. What do you do to fix this field? You're in commercial grain production. Do I have to go fetch more coffee? Come on, somebody give me a suggestion. You want to put a spinner ditch in it? You want to put a permanent swale, grass waterway in? Put a tile well in? Are you going to pattern tile this field? Infinite budget. This is a university farm. We got an infinite budget. <laughs> you going to pattern tile the whole thing? Well, I'm going to tell you, you look at the yield maps, the only time we really see a depressed yield is right in the center of that red area, right in the center here, and in a little bit in here. And otherwise, the rest of the field yield is pretty even and pretty good. You still want a pattern tile? Okay, so if we were to take Nathan's suggestion and pattern tile it, what I would do is put a main across the bottom. I know you guys can't see when you're looking up, but down on the lower part we put a main across here and pattern tile the long way. That would work. You're going to have about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars an acre into doing it. Okay, so other options we could put a swale across here. This is the one I'm most concerned about because this one here is close. It's easy. We've got the elevation. But out here, it's a little trickier. Because this is a university research farm and we have an unlimited budget and we don't want to lose the plot area here, I don't really like the idea of putting a swale across here because I lose so much ground that's not going to be something I can replicate a plot in. Same with up here. So our solution was to put a tile well in. And as we got digging, we found out it was some of the nastiest, stickiest, ugly clay you could ever find. And we wanted to do some drainage before we got to the well. This is a hicken bottom going in right here. So we backfilled with sand. This was done with an excavator. I could have done it with a tile machine, but it was more trouble than it was worth in this case because by the time I got everything set up, we only had to go like 400 feet. It was easier to just do it with an excavator. So you see the laser readout right here. And that's definitely loud enough to beep to get this excavator to shoot on grade. Now, I will give you a major, major hint if you're ever involved in one of these projects. Every bit of tile you put in the ground, bury it as fast as you can. Because what will happen is water starts to come into that trench, tile floats. And once it floats, you're digging it back out with a shovel to get it back on grade. And it is miserable to get mud on, grain, on grade. You have got to pump that water back out, get it dry to get it back on grade. So we always try and put in a 26-foot stick, get it covered up before we even lay the next stick because otherwise we get it in a bright bind. The other side is you start on your outlet end. Don't start going backwards because then you end up with a water problem. So we're going to try again here. This is another field. We've got to ditch at the bottom this time down in this red area. You got to spinner ditch this, swale it, pattern tile it, or tile well it. Spinner ditch. How are you, where are you going to run the spinner ditch? Is, is, is she throwing you under the bus here? <laughs> You're right next to a ditch. So we're going to pull a spinner ditch. Will you want to pull it up this road, through here, or arc it around? Arc it around. Arc it around. Now that's what I would do if 
I didn't know that down in here, it was such a hill from where they dug that ditch and put all the spoils there that I was going to have to make that center ditch about head deep. So I didn't give you all the information you needed. And she, so it's her fault. It's her fault. What other thing would you, could you do here? You could tile well to get through there. You could put a grass waterway to taper that ditch spoil back. In this case, we know that this spot here and there is our real problem area where we really see the yields depress. So it's not as simple as just looking at this elevation map and saying, hey, that's where the hole is. We also need to be considering where the crop gets affected the most. And that's soil type related. I didn't lay a soil map over top of it, but you know, we may have a clay layer under here. In this case, it hasn't been done yet, but it's on the plant list to be done this fall, and fall's quickly ending. Uh, this is gonna get pattern tiled. We're gonna pull the lines straight from this ditch, straight out with a tile machine. Uh, probably 40 foot centers, gate based on the clay that's underneath of it. Uh, it may be able to be stretched out to 50. Uh, in this case, because this is also a university farm, that spacing is going to be adjusted to fit the equipment and the research plots that are commonly done because we don't want a tile line to end up right underneath the middle of a test plot, out, you know, and then not the next one. So, now we got the fun one. How would you, t how would you drain this farm? And I can tell you the only good areas, as far as yield goes, or where that bright green R is, and just the, the yellow to the side of it, uh, there's potholes everywhere. So out of that 60 acres, on a normal year in, say, 2009, you're going to lose 11 acres, and it's going to be in 9 or 10 places. How much do you take to go on the road? About knee-deep. There's some places that it's waist deep, but not a lot. So the first solution, you hit on it already, was dig a ditch from where it says Harbison Road down there in the middle on the bottom towards the corner to the right-hand side. And that solved a little bit of problem. The big benefit was we got a lot of ditch bowl that we could fill some holes in with. <laughs> we, it was much of a burrow pit as it was a ditch. So then looking a little farther, uh, there's clay fingers all through this farm. It just, just like you stuck your hand out. And that clay kind of reaches out in various places. So we decided to pattern tile. But the, dra the outlet was a certainly huge challenge. Rich, how much time did you spend analyzing this field? Probably weeks? A few, few weeks. Coming up with a design. He'd done a lot of work, and then I looked at it and didn't like it. So <laughs> decided I'd change it up. But he had the general idea, and he, he got us going the right direction. Uh, all those O's there are outlets for individual four-inch tile lines, which means they're connected to a buried pipe that had to be put in with an excavator. So there is currently 18 miles of four inch drain tile under there and about two miles of eight inch that was buried with the excavator on this farm. Uh, Corey can comment, it's made a world of difference in the productivity that we've been able to achieve here. We don't have the risk year in and year out of just losing large parts of this farm. Now, big question is, can you afford to do it? We got about $1,000 an acre in this. So from this scheme of was it worth it? For our case, definitely yes, the way this farm was. Every farm, I wouldn't say that's the case. But it costs less to put in the drainage on this intensity level than it did to irrigate it. And there was a farmer, and I told this story yesterday, that told me when I first started working on irrigation that you take care of the drainage first and the irrigation second. I thought he was full of it. And as I've got older, I realized he was right. Okay? Um, I'd much rather be able to put it on. I can put it on however I want, but you, you got to get it off there. You got to get it out of the way first. So, a little antidote here. When we first started putting this tile in, uh, it was rushed on time. And on this north half, so just this half up here, we put tiles on 60 foot center. So every, one, every other one of the lines you see here, and actually, if you paid attention to the opening slide, 
you notice that it was tiled every other one of these. We didn't have time to get to here, to the bottom half, or the back. That was 2014. No, that was, that was the spring of 2015. The fall of 2015, corn's still in the field. We got whatever hurricane name it was. We got 15 inches of rain on this farm in about eight hours, nine hours. After going around four detours for washed out bridges to get there to see what we had, the whole farm was underwater basically, but that, this is all tiled to a lift station that was right here. That pump was running just as hard as it could run. And it only had half of this half of the field tiled. Went back the following morning, there was no standing water on this half. I was two and a half weeks and still had standing water on this half. It was that much water that left from that tile drainage. Now, looking back on it, I have no idea how quick it would have been if I'd been on 30 foot centers because I was just splitting the difference. We, we put it in on 60s and then came back and split the difference and put it on 30s. So I'm going to get a little bit into the details of this installation. We start out rolling the tile out. Uh, this is what's called a maxi spool. There's 3,200 feet of tile, a four inch tile in this particular application. That spool's got a break on it. For those mechanical people that wonder how in the world you get the spool on there, it's hydraulically that arm, that point lays down. You spear it like a hay bale and then it stands back up. Uh, when we put the tile machine in the field, we do a survey that's beyond the level of the survey we're getting out of the planner or any other RTK because we want to make sure it's right. So I'm driving down where my proposed line is and generating that topographic map that you see on the top where everything's shaded gray below. I happen to be sitting right here where this dot is. The software, you can do this either with Trimble products or Ag Leader products, let you set a minimum grade, a minimum depth, and a maximum. This maximum we usually set at 66 because that's what our plow is capable of doing. And we had a target depth of 36 inches and it shoots these two lines that says, all right, those parameters are possible given the topography that you're trying to run across. So we drop a tile plow in the ground, so you fish the tile through the back of it, drop it in a start trench that you dig with either a backhoe or excavator, and you pull it through the field, installing that tile at a 36 inch target depth. I can say that that combination, when you get to 60, 61 inches, is not enough horsepower to pull it. So it is tough to pull this thing. And that's only four inch. You can change these things out and put six and eight inch boots to put really big tile in the ground. And I hate to know what it takes to pull that. But you could tell every time we hit a clay finger, that's when both tractors just fell on their face. When you got back into the sand vein, no problem. So it's more of a soil type determination than anything. And just in case anybody gets a little offended by the brand there, it takes two deers to pull the same plow, okay, just like it does with internationals. All right, so there's doing the installation from the back end. It does leave a big hill. We try our best not to drive over that trench that's down in the bottom because it will crush that tile. We want to fill it in and let it rain on it more than anything to try and push that back. The bottom of the tile plow is not flat. It's curved. It's meant to suit and fit the bottom of that tile, about that plastic tile, because you can crush it, you can oval it. We, that's the last thing we want to do. And the reason I keep harping on accuracy and crushing, you know, I said earlier that if you're auto steering plus or minus an inch, that vertically you're off by four, this tile is only four inches in diameter. If I'm off by four inches, it's not flowing. So we had to have a base station in the field to get that XY axis down to below a quarter of an inch so we could have this vertical accuracy on this tile plus or minus a half. And with four inch tile plus or minus a half, we can make it work. We go very slow, about two miles an hour is as fast as we go. It does not take a lot of power, it takes a lot of weight. It's not the engine horsepower, it's the weight. If you look back here, this thing's got weight stacked all the way across the front of it. All the, every weight we could get on it, that's weighted up. These John Deere tractors are weighted up with as much weight as you can get on them just to pull this thing. And wheels work better than tracks. Uh, there's pull type and three point hitch mounted. And when you pull it in a ditch, you can't just run that black tile right out the side because what's going to happen? It's going to curl. It won't stay straight. You need to sleeve it with something that's more rigid. Uh, using PVC works fine, except you want to use the drain grade PVC, the thin stuff, because when you come to dip this ditch out, that thin stuff, you hang it with excavator bucket, it just bends a little and snaps back. 
the Schedule 40 will break off. Plus, the thin stuff's cheaper. You gotta have a grate across the end of it because every critter known to man will crawl in that daggone pipe and die. And then you got a heck of a mess. So you got to put some sort of rodent guard on the end of it because everything will crawl in there otherwise. Uh, this is installing the main line uh, that all those tiles hook to. That's the pit. Uh, that's the eight inch supply line. It is slotted, it is dual walled. It's a lot easier if you're going with an excavator to handle dual walled. I do not recommend a single wall coiled up pipe to install with an excavator because it's so flexible. When you backfill it, it bubbles and you lose the grade. The dual wall will stay rigid. That's the pit. Going all the way down with a pump in it and that's me filling it back in. <laughs> Landing was a little rough on that rig. All right, so that's, there's your pit with the water coming in. There's four of these outlets on all four corners. It's got a 10 horsepower pump, uh, pumps that water out. Uh, this is a level sensor. It runs off pressure uh, and, and adjusts that. Now, ultimately what we wanted to do is take all this water and pump it to a bioreactor at the same time do automatic sampling so we could get an idea of the concentration and the flow rate so we could kind of get some measurements. This is the irrigation research farm. I have great numbers on what's going on and where. I wanted to get the bottom end of it and see what was coming off, what we we're losing. Well, here's the problem. Running numbers as to how much water should be coming out of this versus a rain event, we're getting less than half the water coming out the pump of what I thought was going to happen. The only thing I can figure out is what's going on is it's coming through that clay vein and getting to a deep sand vein and it's falling back out of my drain pipe in the individual laterals and never make it here, which is a good thing, but it kind of negates the value of us doing the sampling and the concentration levels in the water valve because I have no idea how much water's coming out. So we solved a lot of the drainage problems. We've still got a ways to go. This spring I had a grower call me that he had a farm. As you can see, this thing is, this field has got ditches, ditch, 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 ditch. And this is a very good grower. Really good yields on a lot of his farms. Um, he says, this is always giving me trouble as far as this farm does not produce and it's because we got too much water. I'm thinking about buying a tile plow, but I don't know if it's gonna work. I don't know if this is the application. Don't have a whole lot of real holes in here because we have enough ditches that we can get a spinner ditch to get the water off the surface. That's really not a problem, but we want to try it. So we worked with them, took this elevation data, made a tile plan that looks like this. This is what the software generate as soon as you bring in the RTK data and say set your parameters as to where your outlet's going to be. And you see these, this design down below is for the main that's coming across this ditch. And each of these black dots is one of these lateral tile lines where that's going to hit versus the bottom of the main. So we didn't have a lot of freeboard there. We didn't have a lot of place for water to fall out of that lateral and into the bottom of the ditch, but we had enough to make it work. So if we look at a profile on a lateral, this is what the plan was telling us, that it was legitimate, legitimately possible that we could get that with about a 0.1% grade. So it, it was pretty easy to crank out. So we tried to install it. We did uh, our start holes on the edge of the ditch bank, pulled it, and as we're pulling this tile in, maybe got uh, 300 foot into a tile line, and you start seeing water at the start already. And it was dry when we put this in. So we, we had got, yeah, it was about 300 feet. Some of the runs, it was 500 feet. But it started running water. Everyone of them was running water before we left the site that day. There was a little bit of cloud to it where there was a little bit of silt coming in. By the next morning, they went out to inspect, it had cleared up. There was no obvious sediment that was coming out of that. Um, we put in five, put 15,000 feet of tile in. And you can see she's pawing pretty good right here. And we're only down to about 54 inches, I'm guessing, uh, in this video. The, um, the plow will go down to 66, but we can't pull it. Not with what we've got there. Um, you can see the GPS dome that's on top. That's what's doing the control. And this is controlled with a pitch. So the nose of that plow is pitching up and down. It's in float. The tractor is not controlling the height at all. It's the hydraulics and the pitch of the plow is pitching it up or pitching itself down. 
So here's the yield map after we got it installed. We just installed tile in this center block here, and we left the strip out here with, that, with the tile machine just to see if this was going to work. After cleaning the data up a little bit, here's the tile lines overlaid over top the yield data. So did you see anything obvious benefit there? I didn't. The grower didn't. Looking at that map, didn't see a real big benefit to the tile. Then we went analyzing the combine pass that was right over top of the tile line versus the combine pass in between two tile lines. These, the uh, tile was installed on 40 foot centers. You can see at the beginning 243 and drops down to 222 in between and back up to 248 then 222. But what really I need to dig into a lot deeper is whether we left this stretch out you watch it go from 242 down to 216, down to 209, down to 202, and then pick back up when we get to that first tile line. Something worked a little bit. Is that as nebulous of an answer as you ever get out of a person? Uh, we don't know. I just got this data analyzed end of last week. So we want to look into historically yield-wise, is this area in the middle that's not tiled that doesn't look like it did very well in 2019. Is it usually a yield drag or is it usually on average? Once I get that information from the grower, we're going to try and see, hey, did this really work or not? But there is something there. If we look at the averages strictly of the combine passes above the tile versus in between it, we see about a 15 bushel advantage to the tile. But we have no idea how much this center piece, this center pass, got benefited by having tile on either side of it. It's hard to quantify. That's why we want to come back and look at this section here and see whether it really helped or not. All right, so that leads into, can we start filling in ditches using tiles? So we don't have over, we don't have surface drainage anymore. We're not seeing runoff per se, but we're running it through tiles. So maybe we have the opportunity to filter it. So this is a friend of mine, actually a distant relative of mine, and he had this farm pattern ditched, and he's going to put a pivot in it. Well, rather than put in a whole bunch of tile bridges, he said, we'll fill in some ditches. And he found out real quick why his great-grandfather dug all those ditches. <laughs> because it was a disaster. Now, this was 2009, which was pretty wet. So he came back, he re-dug this ditch here. Put in the bridges. So this is an expensive proposition already. We've gone, we've filled this in, now we've got to dig them back out and admit failure. And this looks like he's got it licked. 2011, he's got her good. This picture from 2016, I say, yeah, he got it good. But if you look at the picture in between in 2013, you still didn't get it. He did not put any tile down where he filled that ditch in. He just filled it in. My grandfather always said, damn it, boy, that ditch was put in there for a reason. Because <laughs> he dug it with a shovel. <laughs> And when you dig it with a shovel, it must be a pretty serious problem. It's not recreational to ride around an excavator and dig a ditch. So in this case, what he could have done and what should have worked, given the experiences that is happening in Somerset County over the past seven or eight years, they would take a tile plow and pull tile on either side of this ditch to intercept that water, like on a hill seep, intercept that water before it ever got to the ditch. Then he could fill the ditch in. There are growers that are going back with an excavator and shooting that ditch on perfect grade and laying tile on the bottom of the ditch and then filling it in. But there's a number of problems with filling ditches in. Where do you get the dirt to fill it back in with? Unless you've got a source on the farm, that can be a really expensive proposition. And it's expensive even if you have a source because you've got to haul it. It's not something you can just pull in from the sides. Now, if you've got, if you're in a lucky situation where you can push the ditch back in, but you're going to have to push that in for 30, 40 feet, and that's no minor undertaking either. You've destroyed the soil structure, stuff's not going to grow right there for quite some time. So I'd say you probably need to haul that dirt in. So after looking at this, this got me thinking, and this is something I added in last night because I couldn't sleep. Uh, this is my farm at home, and in the back corner I have got these six fields, only amounts to 30 acres. I go up and I deal with these guys that say, yeah, this is a small field. It's only 120 acres, and I'm about to blow my mind out. And I got looking, all right, I've got 361 feet 
of end rows where I'm turning with the planter or the sprayer in this field, in these six fields. 3,611. A thousand of them are tapered, so it's on these edges here where I've kind of got some point rows going on. My sprayer is 45 foot wide. I plant 45 feet of end rows for that reason. So I've got 3.73 acres of end rows. If I were to tile every one of these ditches, put dual tile on either side of it, I would need 4,800 feet of tile, and I would go from 3.7 acres to 0.9 acres of end rows. In my experience, my end rows yield 60% of what the regular field does because I've run over them. So if I figure on my average yields, that's amounting in this particular field about 236 bushels of corn per year or 63 bushels of soybeans every year by taking these ditches out. But the big one that I did not really have my head wrapped around until I started running the numbers is I saved 2.2 hours per year spreading, spraying this field because I'm spraying the full run and not spending all my time turning with the booms off. I'm going to save another two hours when I plant because it's only a third of the width of the sprayer. I'm going to save another two hours with the combine every stinking year. I'm looking at, well, it'll take me a week to put this in, but every year I'll save six hours when I didn't really have a whole lot of time. That's why these guys are looking at filling ditches in. It's pure logistics of running field operations and as equipment gets bigger you know this is small equipment imagine a guy that was a big farmer that had 120 foot booms he spent more time turning in these fields than he would spraying you guys that have commercial machines are all nodding your head because you can't make money commercial spraying in Pocomoke but you can in Centerville <laughs> you know it's just geography really kills it okay uh, that's where I'm going to wrap it up unless there's further questions. Anything you need me to go back to, you will see something. Yeah. Traditionally, we would always be thinking about there are soils that need surface drainage and soils that need subsurface. So is it actually that interchangeable? Let's just build a ditch and put in a tile and it works fine. So your question is, instead of the traditional mentality of we need to surface drain certain soils and we can tile drain other soils. I think, I think the, those traditional rules still hold true, but the ease of installation now of subsurface drainage has changed the decision making point as to whether it's worth it or not. Um, you know, the tile you can buy now for, I think the last price I had was about 42 cents a foot. When I put this in, it was like 32. I don't know why it's higher all of a sudden, but um, you know, tile is a bad word in certain parts of this country because of its contribution to nitrogen runoff and all kinds of other accusations that are going on. But in a lot of the area where I am, we're already pattern ditched. So the water's leaving either way. So the question I have is, is tile better than ditching? I have my thought, but I'm not going to answer that question. I'll let somebody more versed in the environmental aspects answer that. Any other questions? Thank you for staying awake, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs>